Friends, uh, let me welcome many of you back to Grace Point. Uh, it is such a joy uh, to see many of you this Lord's Day. And welcome to those of you uh, who are actually on our live stream as well. You will need your Bibles uh, as we look at the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 1 to 10. We are only looking at two verses this morning. There is an outline, uh, and you will find the outline uh, at gracepoint.org.au slash go slash sermon or slash bulletin. And you might actually want to do that. Uh, it will be helpful for you uh, as you follow along as we look at this portion of the Bible this Lord's Day. Let me pray for us. Our Father and our God, we do thank you that you speak in and through your word. We thank you for this wonderful passage that effectively sums up what it means to be a follower of Jesus. We do thank you as well that uh, through these words in Scripture, we might find assurance, uh, we might find confidence uh, in knowing how we are saved, and we just pray and ask you might strengthen us now this Lord's Day. Amen. There are three foundational words that sums up the message of Christianity in a nutshell. And it's found in this passage, this very, very short passage. Three foundational words that sums up the good news of the Christian faith. This is what makes the gospel good news. Three foundational words. I'll give it to you up front. Saved, grace, and faith. Saved, grace, and faith. It's there in your outline. So if you are here today, if you're on the live stream, uh, whether here at Lidcombe physically or at Burwood or Granville, and you're watching and you're trying to work out what does it mean uh, to be a Christian? How do I become a Christian? What makes Christianity different? Well, it's actually here because we're going to look at the heart of the Christian message. Or maybe you're a regular at Grace Point and you've been in our church community for, for a while, and you've been trying to work out how does someone become a Christian? What is a Christian? Well, this passage will actually tell you how someone actually becomes a Christian. Or maybe you are a Christian, but you have doubts like we all do. We have doubts once in a while. How do I know that I'm actually saved? Right? How can I have assurance that I am saved? Well, this passage will actually give you the assurance and confidence that you are saved. And it's found in these three words, three words that I want to suggest to you this Lord's Day. Three words you must not just remember, but three words you must cherish. Three words you must remember, but three words you must love and delight in and immerse yourself in. And it's those three words, three words that sums up what makes you a Christian. Three words that sums up how you are saved. The words saved, grace, and faith. Now, we are only looking at verse 8 and verse 9, okay? Very, very short. And this is the first thing I want you to remember. It's there in your outline. You have been saved. You see the, those first words, verse 8? You have been saved. You have been rescued. Look at what, what Paul says as he sums up the Christian message. For it is by grace you have been saved. True faith. And this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Notice what Paul does not say. Paul does not say this. He doesn't say, uh, you've saved yourself, or that you can save yourself. He doesn't say that, does he? He says, you have been saved, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. It's something done for you. It's something given to you. Someone has worked to save you. Now, I want you to notice, this is the key difference between uh, the Christian faith and every other religious worldview. It's so important to get this right. right. This is the difference. Notice, this is what distinguishes the message of Christianity and the message of religion. Christianity proclaims the good news that someone has worked to save you. It's done for you, not from yourselves, it says. It's God's gift to you. While religion, on the other hand, proclaims good works, what you must do to save yourselves, you must earn it, you must be good enough to deserve it. It is reward for good works done to, that you do. Uh, one proclaims, notice, good news. Good news. Someone has worked to save you. One proclaims good works, that you must do something to save yourself. That's the difference. Now, let's be absolutely clear. The message of the Bible the message of the Bible is the good news that God has worked to save you. That's the message of the Bible. It's not a message of what you must do to save yourself, but what God has done to actually save you. 
But if the message of Christianity is that you have been saved, someone has worked to save you, then it means you have been in some sort of danger. It means you are facing a threat. It means that you are facing some sort of disaster, which is why you need saving. And that's where verse 1 to verse 3 actually comes in. So look with me at verse 1 to verse 3. Verse 1 to verse 3 of this chapter tells us what we have been saved from. See there? Now, until you grasp the bad news, you will not savor the good news, right? Until you understand the bad news that you are in, you will not delight in the good news that comes to you. Look at verse 1 to verse 3. This is why we all need saving. Verse 1 to verse 3, this is the dark valley Paul works, uh, walks us down into so that we see the darkness we have been saved from. As for you, you were dead in your transgression and sins. This is how you lived when you followed the ways of this world, the rule of the kingdom of the air, who is now at work in those who are disobedient, rebels. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh, following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Notice carefully what Paul says in verse 1. It's not like you were drowning and that you were crying out for help. Right? It's not that you were stuck and then you're needing a hand to pull you out. Right? It's not like you were lost and that you needed someone uh, to give you a map to find a way out. No, look at what verse 1 says. This is why you need saving. is because you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Living your way of life opposed to God's way of life. And as his enemy under his wrath. Those three things, right? Now, this is the bad news. Paul says, all people without exception are by nature, in their heart of hearts, in their deepest heart of hearts, spiritually dead in their transgression and sins. They are so dead to God that they live a pattern of life each day. Every waking moment of their life, they live a pattern of life where they break God's commands. That's transgression, where they break God's commands, and where they fall short of His standards. That's sin. Transgression, break God's commands, fall short of God's standard, and that's sin. A pattern of life where they challenge His boundaries in life and where they fail to meet up to His standards, right? So those two words, key words, very important words, transgress, sin. To transgress is to hear what God says and then to seek to break it, to ignore it, to reject it, to go in the very opposite direction. To transgress is to cross a boundary, to deviate from a path, okay? So we deny God's good design in our lives. We hear God's truth and we do the opposite. We hear God's purpose and we ignore it. We hear God's instruction and we challenge it. Uh, we hear God's promises to us and we look for alternatives in our lives. That's transgression. He says no, we say yes. He says yes, we say no. All of us are radically in our heart of hearts anti-God and anti-God authority in life. We are dead in our transgressions. To sin, in contrast, is to fall short of God's standard, okay? To fail to meet up to God's standard. That's what it means to sin, to miss the mark, to fall short of His standards of truth and beauty and justice and kindness and compassion and love. And so the Bible tells us we aren't just anti-God and anti-God authority in life. We can't even meet His standards even if we tried. We fail to meet His standards. Now, that's not to say you and I, we don't do good things. We all do good things, okay? Um, so it doesn't mean that we aren't loving people or kind people. It's just that we fall short of God's standard, His standard of ultimate goodness, His standard of love, His standard of forgiveness. We are dead in our sins. Now, the way I've explained this, and I'll explain it differently today, this is how it works. Now, imagine for a moment that COVID restrictions lift completely. Boy, we're looking forward to that day, aren't we? Because we get to go overseas, right? You know, COVID came in that year, the year COVID came in, which is last year. Our plans, we had plans to go to Hawaii for holidays. We had booked plane tickets. We had even bought snorkeling gear, right? Fins and everything. Now it's just sitting under our bed. But when COVID restrictions lift, imagine for a moment with me, we can resume international travel. We can fly to Hawaii, and on the flight from Sydney to Hawaii, right, you and I are all on that flight. It's an 8,000-kilometer trip. On the flight, the plane crashes into the middle of the ocean. What a terrible way to start the holiday, right? 
So we crash into the ocean, it skids, we're 4,000 kilometers from any landmass. Now on the flight, it just so happens, there are three other people. We look around, there are three other people. There is an Olympic long distance swimmer, there is an average swimmer in the room, and then there's someone who can't swim at all. And we're just watching to see, what are we going to do? And the Olympic swimmer, right, he cries out, follow me because I'll get us out of this. And he jumps into the water, he takes off at an, as a, at an impressive speed, and you just see him disappear into the distance, right? Every stroke moving him towards Hawaii, 4,000 kilometers away. Now, the other two, they don't think, because, and they jump after him. We're just watching, because we're just cautious. Now, imagine with me, they jump after him. The non-swimmer, how, how far do you think he'll go? I think he'll get 50 meters before the waves actually j just dunk him and he will drown. I reckon 50 meters. The average swimmer, how far do you think he'll go? I think he'll probably swim for about 30 minutes before he too drowns as the waves crash over him. But that Olympic distance swimmer, he's still going. And after 24 hours, because he's a distance swimmer, he's probably covered 80 kilometers. That's impressive, that's possible. But you know, he's got another 1,200 hours to go. That's about 50 more days to swim if he doesn't slow down. Doesn't matter who you are. Olympic distance swimmer, average swimmer, non-swimmer, everyone falls short. You, you, yes, yeah, some, they'll go further, but everyone falls well short of the mark, don't they? In God's economy, we are all dead in our sin. No matter how good we are or how good we think we are. David in Psalm 51, wonderful passage, Psalm 51 verse 5. David in Psalm 51 echoes the radical depths of our transgression and sin. And he says, surely I was sinful at birth. Sinful from the time, hear this, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Radically corrupt from the moment of conception. The great myth is that you are born good and that somehow, you know, uh, you learn to sin and that's what makes you sinful. No, no, no. Here we read, no one is born good. We are spiritually stillborn, dead in our transgressions and sin. Not just sinful at birth, sinful from the moment of conception. We're sinful because the very root of our being is stained by sin. You were born with a rebel heart, and which is why you live a rebel's life. And so by nature, verse 3, Ephesians chapter 2 says, deserving of God's wrath, deserving of God's judgment. That is the reason why you and I need saving. Dead people can't save themselves. Dead people don't respond to the call or offer for help. Dead people are powerless to do anything. And as you hear Paul's words, you begin to discover that our problem is even deeper than our transgression and sin. Our problem is deeper than God's judgment and wrath. Yes, we need forgiveness for transgression and sin. Uh, yes, we need someone able to deal with God's wrath on our behalf. But we need something much more because Paul says, you and I, we are radically dead. We, 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 we need a resurrection. We need to be raised from the dead. We need to be made alive. And so if you were locked up in a prison, you might groan, you might cry out for help. You might even say uh, you are sorry, deeply sorry. You might say that. Uh, you might even make promises to be a better person. You might even cast yourself on God's mercy. But what do you do if you're in a morgue? What do you do if you're in a mortuary? What do you do if you're dead? And the answer is nothing. You can do nothing about your condition because the dead are powerless, aren't they? Uh, they can't help themselves. You cannot bring about salvation. Which is why verse 8 says, it's not from yourselves. It is the gift of God to you. And so the Bible's view of your condition is not that uh, you're drowning and you're crying out for help. No, the Bible's view of your condition is that you're dead at the bottom of the ocean. You know, often you hear people say, uh, God actually helps those who help themselves. You know, you've heard that phrase, God helps those who help themselves. Uh, in fact, the vast majority of people, actually religious people and often church people, actually think that the Bible teaches that God helps those who help themselves. God helps those who respond to Him. God helps those, uh, uh, saves those who work hard at things. God helps those who make an effort. But here we read the very opposite, don't we? Look at these verses. 
you are dead outside of Jesus. Dead people cannot help themselves. Dead people cannot respond. Dead people cannot work. Dead people don't make any effort. In fact, the Bible teaches us the very opposite. God helps those who cannot help themselves. God helps those who are helpless. God saves the powerless. He raises the dead so that they might respond. He raises the dead so that they might trust Him. He raises the dead so that they might look to Him. And so look at verse 4 and verse 5. This is how God saves those who are dead in their transgression and sin. But because of His great love for us, God who is rich in mercy, He made us alive with Christ when we were dead in our transgression. It's a wonderful verse, verse 4. Made us alive with Christ when we were dead in our transgressions, which is why it is by grace you have been saved. You see there? Unless God first acts to resurrect you, you remain dead in your transgression and sins. Unless God first unveils our blindness, we remain in darkness. Unless God first gives us life and breathes life into our radically dead and corrupt hearts, we are unable to respond to Him. You see, so, which is why, you know, I said at the start, Christianity proclaims good news that God has worked to save you. It's done for you. It's not from yourselves. It's the gift of God. While religion proclaims good works, what you must do to save yourselves. You must earn it. You must be good enough. It's a reward for working hard. One proclaims good news that God has worked to save you in Jesus. The other proclaims good works that you must do to save yourself. That's why verse 8 says, you have been saved. It's done, it's complete, it's final, it's secure. Remember that. But there's a second thing I want us to look at. Look at verse 8, verse 9. Notice what it says, verse 8. Notice how it starts. It is by grace that you have been saved. It's by God's grace that this has come about. Right? It is by grace you have been saved, true faith. Now, firstly, let me tell you what grace is not. Grace is not a substance, right? It's not a thing. It's not something God puts into you. It's not something God infuses into you so that you respond to Him. No, it's not like God gives us grace to get our salvation started and then we work to sustain it or we work to complete it. Read verse 8 to verse 9. This is what it says. It is by grace you have been saved through faith and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. It is the gift of God. Now, I say this because some people um, actually do believe that grace is a substance. It's, It's like a spark God puts into me, like a dose of salvation to kick things, to start things, you know, to get things going. Some people believe you can actually get more of God's grace by being baptized, by taking the Lord's Supper, uh, by prayer, by doing more good works. And I want to say to you, grace is not a substance. Let me tell you what grace is. Grace is God's unmerited favor. Grace is God's favor, God's love for the undeserving. Here in Ephesians 2, grace is God's merciful attitude and God's merciful action towards the undeserving. He has an attitude of mercy towards the undeserving and he acts mercifully towards the undeserving. He acts to save the enemy, the spiritually dead under his judgment. God uh, God shows mercy towards the guilty, towards his enemies, towards us. God gives us what we don't deserve. Instead of hell, he gives you heaven. Instead of wrath, you get love. Instead of death, you get life. Instead of condemnation, you get forgiveness. Instead of enslavement, you get freedom. And so in God's economy, the currency is grace. The ultimate ground of our salvation is the grace of God. It's free, it's unmerited, and it's undeserved. Okay? Now, Paul says a very similar thing in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. A parallel passage in the Bible. Uh, There you read 2 Timothy 1 verse 9, God saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, underline that, not because of our works, but because of His own purpose and grace, which He gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. Your salvation is free. It's not earned, it's undeserved. Uh, And when you look at these two passages, 2 Timothy 1 9, Ephesians uh, chapter 2 verse 4 and 5, 
uh, they run in parallel. 2 Timothy 1.9 says, A salvation that has come by God's grace given us in Christ. Uh, Ephesians 2, 4 to 5 says, A love expressed by God who is rich in mercy, who made you alive in Christ. It is by grace you've been saved. Notice that God saving you is actually a free gift. It's not earned. It's undeserved. That's what grace is. But it comes at a great cost, doesn't it? A great cost to God who gives it to you freely. It was given to you, notice, in Christ Jesus. Given to you in Jesus. Made you alive in Christ Jesus. Now, this is how grace works in God's economy. It's, it's, it's important to understand how the transaction of free grace works. Have you always realized that there are always two sides to a gift? Right? We've just had Christmas. I'm sure you gave gifts uh, to family and friends. But there's always two sides to a gift. A gift is always free to the recipient. Right? It's always free to the one who receives it. But you know, it's always costly to the giver because the giver has to pay for it. Have you ever realized that? Normally, when you buy someone a gift, you're happy to bear the cost. In fact, what you're willing to bear in terms of the cost, what you're willing to pay often reflects your love for the person you have gifted. That's how it works, okay? Which is why, right? Some of you, you gave me, no offense, some of you, you gave me a box of chocolate for Christmas. I came to the office, I found a box of chocolate in my desk. I didn't find a $5,000 watch on my desk, so I know how much you love me or how much you don't love me, okay? Right? Elliot this year, right? I know Sherilyn loves him, bought him a secret lab chair. That's about a $500 chair, right? So that's love, okay? She didn't just buy him a box of chocolates. And so, norm and so, and so, and so normally, uh, the value of the gift the value of the gift we give someone reflects how much we love them, okay? But what about someone who's undeserving? What about someone who's undeserving? What cost would you be willing to bear for them? What would you be willing to spend on a gift for the undeserving? Now, understand the transaction of God's grace. God gifts the undeserving. It's free to you, to each of you, but it costs Him the life of His Son. Did you hear that? He gives the undeserving. It's free to you, but it costs him the life of his son. God says, I'll bear the cost to save you. I'll pay for your transgression and sin with the life of my son. I'll bear the cost of your judgment by pouring it all out on my son. And so you read verse 8 and verse 9. It is by grace you have been saved. When you were dead in your transgressions and sins, when you were living the life of a rebel, when you were under judgment, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Oh, that's grace, isn't it? That's good news. God gives you something you don't deserve, and He pays for it Himself. And that's the reason why we can hear those wonderful words, it is by grace you have been saved. The saved is possible because someone else paid for it. God paid for it in the life of His Son. That's why you read Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, we have been redeemed by His blood. We read later, Ephesians 2, verse 13, we have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. That's what the death of Jesus is about. That's what the cross is about. You know, we have a logo at Grace Point that we often ignore. Most people don't even realize. That's our logo at Grace Point. And, you know, in, in, about, in the last decade, no one has asked me, what does the logo stand for? And we haven't really made a big deal out of it. But, you know, if you look at our logo at Grace Point, at the center of our logo is the cross. That's why it's there, right? A symbol of God's costly grace, undeserved grace, a costly grace to God so that it can be freely given to you. And so every time you hear the word grace, every time you sing of God's amazing grace, remember that your salvation is a free gift. It costs you nothing, but it costs God the life of His Son the life of His Son, to save you. Free for the undeserving, but costly to the giver who has saved you. And He did it so that you might live. Such is the grace of God. Grace is God's unmerited favor, God's love in Jesus for the undeserving. And that's why we read verse 8, for it is by grace you have been saved, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Church, remember that. Now, here's the third thing I want you to know as we look at verse 8, verse 9. Here it is. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. You see there? True faith, verse 8. By grace you have been saved through faith. This not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Now, at the heart 
of the message of the Bible is that we're saved by God's grace through faith. And I want to say to you that it's not faith in itself that saves, okay? Faith always has an object, right? Faith always has an object. Faith is never an end in itself. Uh, it always has, has an object. In fact, if you think with me for a moment, faith by definition doesn't just have an object, but we also exercise faith all the time, every day. Faith is not a religious thing. Faith is an everybody thing and an everyday thing. Have you realized that? It's an everybody thing, everyday thing. Uh, so let me give you an example. I exercise faith whenever I drive my car. Okay? I believe it's a good car, which is why I bought it, and I trust it won't break down. I trust it's going to get me places. That's why I drove the car this morning. Uh, I exercise faith whenever I sit in my chair. When you sat in the chair this morning, because you believe the chairs were reliable, they weren't going to fail you, they would support your weight, and you sat down. That's faith. Uh, I exercise faith when I order my bowl of ramen from Ipudo. I believe it's one of the best ramen around in Sydney. Uh, and I trust that the chef isn't going to poison me. And so I willingly eat the ramen. That, I exercise faith when I do that. Understand this. Faith is not a religious thing. It's an everybody thing. And it's an everyday thing. We exercise faith every day. Uh, so too the saving work of God's grace. It requires faith. You know that? It requires faith. It is the instrument or means by which God's salvation comes to us. Notice it's by grace you have been saved through faith. Faith in who? Faith in Jesus' work. Believing that Jesus' work is reliable. It's trustworthy. It's enough to save me. Believing that Jesus' work is sufficient to save me. If God has demonstrated His saving grace in Jesus then salvation comes through faith in His work, in trusting His work for you. Now, notice that God's grace and God's gift sandwiches you have been saved in verse 8. Look at verse 8 very carefully. Notice you have been saved is sandwiched by God's grace and the gift of God. Can you see there? And the reason why it's there, because it's a reminder to us that it's all God's gift. Grace to the undeserving right? It's sandwiched in between to remind us that even your faith is a gift of God. Look at verse 8, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. You know, the great myth is that our relationship to God is transactional. God contributes grace, you contribute faith. You know, some people think like that. No, remember what we've been saved from. You were dead in your transgressions and sins. The dead have no faith. The dead have no faith. The dead can express no faith. God had to make you alive in Jesus. He had to resurrect you before you could actually believe, before you could have faith. He had to raise the dead soul. He had to quicken the spirit. He had to replace the heart of stone with a heart of flesh. And saving grace is not grounded in me, the recipient of God's grace, not in the one receiving the gift, not in me, not even in my hands, but in the object of my faith. Uh, there are many Christians who think that they need more faith to be Christian. I meet a lot of people across Grace Point who do think like that. Uh, I meet people who think that until they can have enough faith, they cannot be a Christian. Uh, or that their faith is not strong enough to save them. And the reason why sometimes many of us, many of us here, you know, we, we feel that our faith is shaky. The reason why we feel that way is because often we lose sight of the object of our faith. We start focusing on our hands rather than what has been placed in our hands. You know, when you receive a gift or a present, you know, you, you, don't, you don't look at your hands, do you? It's a kind of a weird thing to do, to focus in your hands when someone gives you a gift. No, your eyes are on the gift, which is why we are to always cast our eyes, our hearts, our minds on God's saving grace to us in Jesus. That's the gift, the object of our faith always remains firm, unchanging, complete. That is where we're called to anchor. That's who we're called to place our faith in. And so I want to say to you that your faith doesn't save you. Your faith doesn't save you. It's who you put your faith in that saves. So important to remember that. You know, if you've been skydiving, some of you at this church have done that. If you've been skydiving, it doesn't matter how much faith you have, uh, or don't have when you jump out of that plane, 
right? It's not like if I have more faith, I'll land safely. If I have less faith, right, I might die. No, the instructor does not say that, right, when you go skydiving. It doesn't work that way. It all depends on one thing, the reliability of your parachute and whether you put it on. You want to make sure that your parachute is reliable, that it's trustworthy, that it's going to work. Faith in your parachute is what will save you. Your faith doesn't save you. It's who you put your faith in that saves. It's who you trust that actually saves. So let me tell you now what faith is not. Faith is actually not subjective feeling. That's not faith. True feelings may reflect faith, but not all emotions you go through reflect the presence of God's saving faith. Faith is not psyching yourself up to believe. You know, it's like, I believe, I believe, I believe. No, it doesn't work that way. That's trusting in your own self-confidence. That's trusting in your feelings to save you. Notice what verse 8 says. And this is not from yourselves. And this is not from yourselves. What makes saving faith secure and strong and real is the object of your faith. The grace of God to you in the saving work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because of His work, I'm alive. Right? Because of His work, I'm raised. Because of His work, I'm forgiven. Our faith is in the gift of God that He has placed in your hands. Start looking at the gift. God's grace to you in the saving work of Jesus. Faith is also not just intellectual assent. Okay? James in chapter 2 tells us that even the demons believe the Christian message, right? They understand God's saving work, but it doesn't save them. I was having a conversation with a leader at church yesterday, and he was telling me about what he read in C.S. Lewis, and he said, there's a difference, isn't there, between belief in something and believing in something. And very profound. There's a difference between belief in something and believing in something. One is intellectual assent. Knowing something, belief in something, that the other is trust, believing in something. And saving faith is not just intellectual sin, it is trust. It must receive God's gift, it must express personal trust in God's gift. Saving faith must trust God's work of saving grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, in 1987, uh, Anne Seward uh, was a resident in Portland, Oregon. And uh, there was a big celebration uh, in the city of Portland. And she was asked to co-star with a very well-known high-wire artist, a guy called Philip Petit. Uh, and they wanted her, or she was invited, to walk across with him on an 80-foot wire between two buildings six stories high. Okay? He was going to carry her across. Uh, and so on August 31st, uh, Anne put her life into the hands of this man who carried her on his back while he performed six stories above the street. Okay? Now, many of those who saw the performance actually believed that Petit could actually do this, carry someone across on his back on this high wire six stories up. And, and they had sufficient reason to believe he could do it. Why? Because this guy is amazing if you Google him. He's walked on the high wire across the Twin Towers. He's walked across Niagara Falls on a high wire like the great Blondine. He walked across the high wire of the two towers of Notre Dame. Uh, he also did walk across the high wire of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. All of this, by the way, he did illegally, right? Somehow he sneaked in, put the wires up and walked across. So people believed he could do it. But their belief was only intellectual. Uh, and Anne's belief was a personal one. She actually trusted him with her life. And she expressed her trust by putting her life into his hands. There is no real faith without trust, okay? Now, I have to be honest with you. I read a story like that, and I thought to myself, I would not have gotten Petit's back. Now, let me tell you why. Firstly, there's the me factor, right? The me factor. Well, what if I emotionally lost it midway through? What if I panicked? Well, we would both die. Or then, then there's the chance factor, okay? What if the rope snapped? Or even worse, what if there was a gust of wind? We would both die. But then there's also the Petit factor, what if the only time he makes the one mistake in his life is when I'm on his back, okay? See, I can believe with all my heart that the guy can actually carry me across, but I would not trust him with my life. Now, there's a difference between Petit and Jesus. Jesus cannot drop me. His work is secure. I cannot even drop myself. 
because I was dead. There's no such thing as chance. It was intentional. His saving work is absolute, final, and complete. For it is by grace you have been saved. It's done. It's complete. And you receive it through faith by trusting Him. Trust God's saving work of grace to you in the Lord Jesus Christ. You are saved by grace through faith in Him. And so when you feel the weight of your sin, when you doubt whether God truly loves you, when you think that you're not good enough to be a Christian, when you think you have to pay back for your failure, when you feel like a failure because of your sin, when the voices around you accuse you of failing God, you can't be a Christian, when you wonder whether you're really a Christian, the great temptation will be to look inward. The great temptation will be to look at your faith, okay? To look at your hands. And I want to say to you, stop it. Stop it. You need to look at the object of your saving faith. Stop looking at your hands and start looking at what is in your hands. You're saved by grace through faith in His saving work. Stop looking at how you feel and start looking at God's saving grace to you in the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at His work for you. You know, that's why in our logo at Grace Point, the cross is at the center and the arrow points up. Why do you think the arrow points up? The arrow points upward because it's telling us, look up and trust the saving work of the Lord Jesus Christ for you. You are not at the center of the circle at Grace Point. The cross is a reminder to you that you're saved by grace through faith in Jesus who died for you. In fact, in our logo, right, in our logo at Grace Point, have you ever wondered where you are? Well, you're actually the circle, if you've never realized this. You are the circle. You are part of the circle, the community of faith, the people of God, saved by God's grace, called to trust in the saving work of His Son for you. That's where you sit. You know, the late evangelist John Chapman, he used to speak here at Grace Point uh, in the early days of Grace Point. Uh, he used to share his wisdom on doubt in the Christian life. And this is what he would say, when I get up in the morning and have had enough of being a Christian, I sit on the end of my bed and I swing my legs over the side and I say, John Chapman, have you had any fresh information that Jesus Christ did not live? No, I have not. And John Chapman, have you had any fresh information that Jesus Christ did not die for you, rise from the grave and promise to return? No, I have not. Well, John Chapman, keep going. It's obviously the best thing to do. You are saved by God's grace through faith, through trusting in Jesus' saving work for you. Remember that. You know, three foundational words, so foundational, aren't they? Saved, grace, faith. Now, if there's any notion or thought that I somehow have a part to play in saving myself, in securing God's forgiveness, notice how Paul ends. Look at verse 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it's the gift of God. And then he ends, not by works so that no one can boast. It's not like, oh, God's work 90%, my work 10%. No, it's not from yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works. It's God's work 100%. The great reformer John Calvin, he writes of this passage, he says, salvation is not a reward, is not a recompense, right? Not something you pay for. He says, it is unmixed grace. Oh, write that down. Beautiful. It's unmixed grace, untainted grace, unstained grace, unpolluted grace. If on the part of God it is grace alone and we bring nothing but faith, which God also gives, then we are stripped, he says, of all commendation, of all pride, of all works. It follows salvation does not come from us. It's unmixed, unmixed grace. Salvation does not come by your works. It's God's work of grace in Jesus Christ. You know, one of my all-time favorite movies we used to watch heaps when the children were growing up is Finding Nemo. Oh, it's just one of those movies that really tugs at your heartstrings. In fact, you know, it's one of the few movies, uh, animation you watch where you're like, oh, you tear up, but you're trying not to tear up. You're just like trying to hide your tears. But in Finding Nemo, there's this scene, right, where Dory says, when life gets you down, do you know what you got to do? And all of you know, just keep swimming, just keep swimming, swimming, swimming. Right? You know it. You know that's what religion says. If you want to get saved, if you, if you want heaven, if you want forgiveness, if you want God's acceptance, if you want assurance, you know what you're going to do? Just keep swimming, just keep swimming, swimming, swimming. Your good works can save you. 
Your good life can make up for your sin. Your law keeping can earn God's forgiveness. And it's actually also what the secular says, right? Help comes not from out there, but from within you. You need to work harder. You need to be smarter. You need to be better. Nothing's free in life. You have to earn it. You have to be good enough. And when life gets hard, you know what you should do? You know what you got to do? Again, just keep swimming, just keep swimming, swimming. So work hard. It'll save you. Your intellect can secure your future. Your success will get you what you want in life. Now, let me be very honest with you. That might be okay for Dory, the blue tang, but it's actually not the language of salvation in the Bible. And you would be foolish to bank your eternity. You would be foolish to bank your salvation on the wisdom of Dory, the blue tang. Many people do. It's not the message of Christianity. Notice verse 9, not by works so that no one can boast. You know, if your, if your eternal salvation depended on your morality, your law-keeping, your good works, your performance, author Kent Hughes writes, eternity would spawn, he says, a fraternity, a fraternity of rung-dropping, name-dropping, chest-thumping boasters, and an endless line, he says, of celestial Pharisees crying out, God, I thank you, I'm not like the other person, the immoral, the robber, the evildoer, the adulterer. Now, hear these words, not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. There's a finality to it, isn't there? In fact, in Finding Nemo, you know what happens, right? Marlin and Dory, they do not get to Sydney by swimming all the way. It's a 2,000-kilometer trip. Dory's just keep swimming is impossible. What do they do? They ride the back of a turtle on the EAC, the East Australian Current. That's how they get to Sydney to find Nemo. They let the current carry them. They let the current do the work. They trusted the powerful current to get them to their destination. Now, friends, hear this. That's how it works in God's economy. The currency in God's economy is not your good works. The currency is God's grace to the undeserving. Your part is your sin and rebellion. You bring a ledger that says you are bankrupt. You have nothing to negotiate or offer God, but God responds graciously, verse 4 and verse 5, in His great love, in His great mercy, He made you alive in Christ. Salvation is by God's grace through faith in Jesus' work alone, not yourself. It's God's gift to you. Trust the currency of God's grace. Now, in these two verses, I want to say to you as we bring our time to a close, we have a summary of the message of Christianity, a summary of the message of the Bible, the good news, you're saved by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus' saving work alone. There must be no misunderstanding. Write it down, right? Hide it in your hearts, of hearts. Imprint them on your minds. Grasp this truth. You, you who work so hard to earn God's salvation, you, know, you who think you can win God's love by your works, those of you who think that somehow you know, your good work gives you assurance, it is by God's grace through faith in Jesus that you are saved. It's God's gift to you. When Satan assaults your thoughts, reminding you of your sin, your history of failure, our tendency is to work harder, trying to make up for our failure. We need instead to run to Jesus to find assurance. The object of my faith that God in His grace has given me is by grace you've been saved through faith in Jesus, not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one may boast. You know, when you doubt your salvation, as you will, when I feel I'm faltering in my faith, when I aren't sure whether I'm saved because of my sins. We need to run to Jesus to find assurance, the object of our faith that God in His grace has given us. When I compare myself to others and, and, and am tempted to be proud and to think that I'm better than others, God, God thinks me better than others because, you know, I do more, I'm more generous. When I think that my contribution makes me more acceptable to God, I need to be rebuked. That is the fastest way to hell. We need to hear verse 8 and verse 9, and we need to run to Jesus to find our true assurance, the object of our faith that God in His grace has given us in the saving work of the Lord Jesus. Look, here's a spiritual discipline worth remembering in your life. Resolve in your life each day to preach this grace to yourself each day, to resolve in your life to live by this grace, to grow in this grace, to remind yourself each day, to remind yourself each day, to say to yourself, I am a creature of God's grace. 
not the work of my own hands. I'm a creature of God's grace, right? The only contribution to my salvation is this. I came as a corpse. I brought my sin. I was a rebel. I was enslaved. That is what I brought to God. But actually, if you think about it, I didn't bring myself to Him, did I? Because I was dead in my transgression and sin. I am a creature of God's grace. He ran after me. He sought me out. In God's economy, I am loved because of God's undeserved grace to me in Jesus. In God's economy, I am alive because of God's undeserved grace to me in Jesus. I am forgiven because of God's undeserved grace to me in Jesus. I am secure forever because of God's undeserved grace to me in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the 19th century preacher D.L. Moody, he said, the thief on the cross had nails through both hands so he could not work. He had a nail through each foot so that he could not run errands for the Lord. He could not lift a hand or a foot towards his salvation. And yet Christ offered him the gift of God and he took it. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one may boast. In a moment, the music team are going to lead us in that wonderful song. Simply to the cross I cling, naked I come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace, foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. Let me pray for us. Our Father and our God, we do thank you for the good news. You alone can rescue. You alone can save. You alone can lift us from the grave. You came down to find us. You led us out of death. And so to you belongs the highest praise. Amen.